So hello, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us um, on this uh, webinar this uh, today, uh, morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you may be in, in the world. Um, we wanted to get together to have a conversation about um, motor efficiency in the mining industry. Um, this is important to us because uh, about 3% of industrial energy use goes into mining and um, electricity accounts for 44% of that. So electricity going through numerous motors in the system, um, many of which we believe could be more efficient and we're looking for uh, experience from countries around the world on how we can improve that efficiency. So we've brought together a panel of people from some important mining countries to share their experience. This is just one conversation on a journey um, where we're trying to build a picture of what um, governments could be doing in terms of uh, policy to promote energy efficiency in mining. Um, and um, we'll, we'll continue the conversation having enriched it with today's conversation. And with that, I will hand over to my friend and colleague, Steve Kokoda, to make some opening remarks. Great, thanks so much, Mel. And thanks to the IEA for putting a spotlight on, on motors and efficiency and its role in climate action more broadly. I mean, motors and, and the systems they drive are, account for about half of global electricity consumption. And in some countries, that, like highly industrialized nations like Japan, that could be as high as, as 70%. So let me, uh, first of all, introduce myself. I'm Steve Kokoda with the International Copper Association, and I lead our global partnerships work. Well, you know, why copper? You know, copper is one of the, the critical building blocks for the clean energy transition. According to McKinsey, two thirds of the solutions we need to decarbonize will require copper, um, and and ICA is, I would say, one of the the leading advocates when it comes to to motors in terms of efficiency, in terms of standards, but also developing uh, technologies to make motors more efficient. Earlier this year, we formed the the Motor Efficiency Global Alliance, or MEGA, uh, along with the the IEA. United for Efficiency and some some other key partners and MEGA is intended to be all things related to motors. And Mel mentioned minimum energy performance standards, MEPS. Now, these are critical and, uh, you know, MEPS for motors are largely in place, I would say, in the OECD countries, not so much in, in the developing world. But even where we, we have MEPS, you know, we'd like to see increased uh, increased ambition. You know, the technologies for motors have, have come a long way and the MEPS need to, need to keep up with that. Um, but we also advocate for the early replacement of electrical motors. You know, MEPS address the future, so we ensure that we have a baseline for the products that are entering the marketplace. The issue, though, is that motors have long lifetimes. And now let's, hear, let's get directly into the mining sector. Um, Chile is the the largest producer of, of copper in the world. About thirty percent of our copper comes from Chile, and we did an audit a few years ago of several mines there, and we showed that the average replacement time for a motor was thirty seven years. Now Chile has MEPS in place, but it's going to take decades for that market to catch up to the MEPS, and we don't have decades for for climate action. I mean, forty six percent of the electricity consumed in the mining sector in Chile goes to their electric motors. So with this in mind, we're in the process of forming a new initiative to support Chile's mining industry. And that will focus on MEPS. We'd like to see Chile, you know, to be more ambitious when it comes to MEPS and maybe to have some regional cooperation there. Um, but it is also focused on early replacements. So trying to get at that installed base. And, and this is a, this is an issue not um, limited to Chile. We see this more broadly as well, that while we're not seeing this, this turnover of the installed base, it's, it's just it's a dollars and cents issue. You know, capital expenditure budgets are, are limited. Um, they focused on, you know, necessary maintenance, uh, products that are truly at their, at their end of life, and then a functioning motor doesn't become a priority. We estimate that the payback period for motors in Chile can be as low as two years and four years in the worst case scenario. I said a 37 year average replacement time. So, you know, the motor can pay for itself 10 times or, or more. So in this initiative, we're also trying to build 
financing to support the the mining sector and we're doing that through uh, through mission efficiency so i invite you to learn more about mega mega dash initiative.org and uh, mission efficiency.org and um you know we're looking forward to the discussion and uh, thanks again to the iea for for bringing us together here today Many thanks, Steve, um, and um, thanks for that really important kind of context setting to, to demonstrate why, why we're here today and, and the sorts of things that we, we need to talk about. Um, we have, um, when we've been talking to countries like Chile, who are less advanced in their development of their efficiency standards um, for, for things like motors, you know, they've come across um, a number of barriers that they found. And what we're hoping in this conversation today is to explore some of those and see what advice we can we can give or what uh, future research needs to be done um, through projects like MEGA um, to, to make sure that we can um, we can help um, remove those barriers and, and, and make and make progress much more quickly in this. So for our panel today, um, we're very lucky to have with us um, Marcus Seller, who's from Canada, Chris Bloomfield from Australia, and Maputi Ligoti from South Africa, all people that we've worked with um, and who have, who represent um, energy efficiency policies um, that are really important to um, the global knowledge, um, uh, but also have been chosen because they have very significant mining sectors. Um, and so um, with that, I'd like to um, perhaps ask um, each one of our panel members firstly to to reflect on what they see as, as, as the current challenges. So maybe if you could just each take two or three minutes to, to set to set the scene in your context and let us know the, 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 the good things and the not so good things that you've been, been experiencing and, and then we can dig into them perhaps a, a bit more. So maybe just uh, because of the, how people appear on my screen, maybe I could go to Marcus first, if that's okay. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to this panel. And I'm from, um, I work for the uti electric utility here in Vancouver, British Columbia. The utility is called BC Hydro. We are 98% clean and renewable electricity generation. So very fortunate to have um, such a power grid. We have uh, very resource intensive industries in British Columbia, such as mining, pulp and paper, and oil and gas sector. Um, like it was mentioned before, a lot of it is, only a portion of it is electrified or electric, uh, powered by electricity. The major energy use in British Columbia is still 70% fossil fuels. And that's a significant portion to for as a decarbonization opportunity. So I work for the utility. We have a number of initiatives and programs for industries such as industrial energy managers that play a key role in implementing energy efficiency, low carbon electrification projects, load management, behind the meter distributed energy resources, energy storage, decarbonization strategies, and demonstration of innovative electric technologies, participation in advisory committees for collaborative research in mining and pulp and paper, and interact with uh, our alliance of energy professionals and service providers to identify and investigate and implement energy efficiency projects. So motor efficiency is very dear to my heart. I've been involved in motor efficiency since um, I was a co-op student many, many years ago. And we've the, Canada is a leader in standard development through the Canadian Standards Association which I still participate in several committees, developing standards on motor efficiency, drive efficiency, transformer efficiency, and uh, actually a, a new area that we're participating in is, is motor refurbishment testing to make sure that efficiency is retained to the, throughout the long life of electric motors. So with that, I'll pass it on to Chris, I guess is next. 
Thank you, Marcus. My name's Chris Bloomfield. I work for the Australian government in a department called the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water, or DQ for short. Uh, I manage Australia's industrial energy efficiency policy, which incorporates both manufacturing and our resources sector. The resources sector is a really critical part of Australia's economy. It accounts for more than two thirds of Australia's export earnings uh, with iron ore, coal and natural gas being the top three and seven out of the top 10 all being resources exports. And it's a really significant part of our domestic energy mix. Uh, Australia's domestic energy consumption is about 4,000 petajoules of which about 860 is in the resources sector. So it, it's a biggie for us. It's, it's not 4%, it's 20% plus. Uh, it's also worth noting that many of our resources uh, energy uses are not grid connected at the moment. So of that 860 odd petajoules, about 700 is fossil fuel with about 160 uh, electrified. And that means that uh, the quantum of energy used in fossil fuels in our resources sector is about the same size as Australia's current electricity sector. So that presents a real opportunity, but also a real challenge on how to transition smart to lower carbon resources. I'll also talk a little bit about the opportunities we see. Um, we see a big capital investment wave coming across the resources sector at the moment. And that's partly driven by a change in the commodity mix. Uh, our Two of our large exports, um, LNG and coal, uh, I'm not sure people would consider them growth industries, but other commodities like lithium certainly are. So some sectors of the resources industry are rapidly expanding and planning additional capacity, which provides the opportunity to get equipment installed smart the first time round. And the, the second big investment wave we see, uh, there is a strong drive to decarbonize the resources sector. Uh, this is driven both by investors seeking lower carbon investments, uh, but also by regulatory pressure within Australia. Many of our resources companies are captured by the safeguard mechanism, which imposes a declining baseline for carbon emissions on our largest emitters. So many of them are busy trying to figure out how to decarbonize which gives the opportunity to get the settings right and get that investment done right the first time round. So really exciting space. Uh, I'm also quite upfront that uh, Australia is not a leader in our current minimum standards, uh, particularly in electric motors. Our current minimum standard is for IE2 motors, which is not one of the leaders amongst the OECD. But we're currently undergoing a, a reform of our greenhouse and energy minimum standards program, which provides the opportunity to reset and uplift some of those standards. And really keen to hear from the rest of the panel, uh, both what to do to set the standards at the right level, but also to capture the right equipment. We see many of our uh, resources companies as they're decarbonizing they're used to buying electric motors for a pump or for a fan or for a grinding system where they typically buy a motor. But the equipment they're buying now is far more complex packaged equipment. They're not buying a motor, they're buying a battery electric haul truck. And our, our interest is both how to target traditional motors, but also how to expand the scope of uh, motor standards into the packaged and complex equipment that companies are ordering. And at that point, uh, I'll pass across to our next panelist, Maputi. Good, good, good. Good morning, colleagues here in South Africa, still in the morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, uh, my name is, is, is Maputilo Rodi. I'm with the Department. I'm with the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy in South Africa, um, in the office or in the unit uh, responsible for energy efficiency projects, 
uh, energy efficiency, policy development, and uh, uh, stakeholder engagement. Uh, I would be talking to the uh, the context around the uh, South African industrial perspective insofar as energy uh, or other electric motors is concerned, and just to give a perspective of where we are as a country in respect of, of trying to address the issues pertaining to inefficiencies in the industrial sector, but also taking into account the fact that uh, over the last 10 years, um, South Africa has been struggling with energy availability in terms of electricity supply. And, and, and therefore, energy efficiency within the industrial sector plays a significant role in making sure that we minimize the impact of load sharing, which also would then benefit the partly the economic uh, uh, development or economic performance, which over the years we have seen our economy shrinking as a result of the ongoing load sharing. So the perspective to address or to deal with issues of efficiency within the industrial sector is one of the issues around the the energy security in total. So I'll be talking to our view and our approach in so far as um, the electric motor systems uh, improvement in terms of energy efficiency will be approached within the industrial sector. Thank you very much. Thank you all for those those introductory words. Um, I'd like to, um, having, having listened to that, I'd like to start by asking um, about uh, conversations and how your conversations have been going with industry. Um, I mean, Steve brought, brought this up in his opening remarks, and I think this is something that you, you kind of all, all have, 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 have dealings with. How do, you, um, how do you develop policy that um, you have consulted well with with an industry and you, you know it's going to be um, followed through. Um, we see some countries introducing maps without doing that process and you end up with this kind of conflict. I mean, how, how, how do you think it's best done? Um, and I'll start with Marcus because you've been you've been thinking about this for a long time. Yeah, um, it's industry wants to make sure whatever they are doing is relevant. It needs to save money and energy for them. So you have to give them the right information at the right time. Um, we found that the system approach or a focus on the reduction of energy losses is often more important than the efficiency improvement. And I'm saying that is because part load efficiency might be less then full load efficiency of a piece of equipment, but the energy loss reduction or the energy consumed at part load is much, much lower than at full load. So it's not only about efficiency, but it's also about energy performance and uh, reduction of energy waste. We have also launched an, another series of standards that is of very high interest to the industry and we call them a user-oriented standards that make energy performance more relevant and specific to the application and as part of strategic energy management practices. Uh, we've realized that the maps are very limited in size and scope and application. I mean, maps are typically one to 500 horsepower and whether it's IE2 or IE3 or IE4, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, but it's um, it's very limited to what actually falls under the regulatory framework of um, maps. Even in that horsepower range, you're still only capturing probably only half the motors that are installed because the others are not general purpose motors, but definite purpose motors or or something unique that um, does not that usually exempt from the map maps regulation. So we are really looking with our customers to make give them opportunity that are and give them information that is user oriented, 
rather than just um, a regulatory ref compliance and with enforcement um, that may not make the fullest benefit of um, strategic energy management. So thank you, Marcus. That's really interesting and um, really important. Um, we've had several mentions so far already of the kind of systems approach. And this is, I think, a, a build on that. We not just looking at the individual motor, which perhaps is easy to regulate, but is um, not necessarily representative of the whole market that we're trying to impact. So um, hopefully you might be able to share those uh, user oriented regulations with us so that we can we can share them around uh, interested parties and see see whether that's an approach other people might want to build upon. Chris, you um you you have a you know a, a strong regulatory process that requires discussion with industry at, at various steps. How how how's that going in terms of things like motors and mining? Um, are you finding more interest because it's more interest in climate now, or are you still finding it being a a, a, a sort of more of a controversial conversation? What what's the status there in Australia? Yeah, I I wouldn't say it's easy to to open the discussion. Um, Australian industry tends to be a little bit allergic to regulation, so that discussion is never easy nor straightforward. Uh, but but saying that, uh, it's good to understand what the drivers are from their shoes and what we can do to try and align the discussion with that. And if, if I look at some of the feedback with some of the, the resources companies we talk with, uh, one of the biggest challenges in this space for them is time. And you can put that in two, two categories. There's those who's trying to build a new mine and they're racing to get first production. And they're not really caring about life cycle levelized costs. They might in a couple of years, but right now they are racing to get a particular product, product to market. They're trying to get lithium out while the price is high or uh, another commodity to, to get first um, output. And that time pressure means that during that design phase, their, their focus is on how do I do it quick rather than how do I optimize the life cycle costs. And I think part of our, our role as policymakers is to help make the case for the life cycle costs and nudge where you can on the influences for investment. So we're doing quite a bit around uh, our ESG investment frameworks and disclosures in Australia, because if you can turn off or change the flow of investment into, into new assets, it'll change behavior. Now it's not minimum standards, but it's another way to drive uh, behavior. The, the other group that are, are captured by time, um, most mines have a finite life and some commodities I, I might be brave enough to say also have a finite life. Uh, someone looking at, at thermal coal mines while we're busy decommissioning um, thermal coal power plants is probably reluctant to invest in an asset they think has a limited lifetime. So we have the other piece of time where they're, they're, they're uncertain about the life of an asset and getting the payback on new investment. And I, I think trying to deal with that paradox of, of time, those who are trying to get things up and run, running quickly uh, versus life cycle cost is one of our um, policy challenges. And the, the other one that's really fascinating for us, and it may be a bit unique to Australia where many of our mines are not connected to the grid, uh, flexibility of load is really high on many of our miners' agendas. And the reason for that is that they're, they're busy trying to decarbonize their remote area power supplies. They're building wind and solar, uh, but those variable renewables, they can't firm it with a grid they're left with the firming cost. You can't fix it with a transmission line. You can't fix it with an import or an export to another area. So you have to deal with the cost of firming yourself, which means that for those remote area power supplies, they're really interested in the flexibility of their loads. 
So if they look at electrification of, of fleet, it might come to how do I sequence and charge when solar resources are abundant, as opposed to needing to, to implement a lot more storage in their remote area power system or keep a higher fraction of fossil fuel in their remote area power system. So I think those are some of the sort of macro drivers they're ones which give us more case because there's investment happening in, uh, in these sites, uh, but it hasn't helped to the discussion of why, why should we raise or broaden uh, the coverage of our minimum energy performance standards. And that's one that we're, we're busy trying to unpack and drive at the moment. And as I started this response, it's, it's not proving to be easy. Uh, and if, if anyone else has any smart suggestions on how to deal with all the new types of kit that are coming in, really keen to hear it. Thanks, Chris. I enlightening, I think, I have to say, and probably a foresight of the problems that um, we, we, we see to come for others who are trying to improve efficiency in these areas. Um, Maputi, um, when in your dealings with the mining industry in, in South Africa, which is obviously uh, massively important to economic growth, massively important to employment. How, what sort of response do you get when you want to talk to them about efficiency? Is it something that they're, they're prepared to talk about? Do you have to impose policy that because they don't want to talk about it? What, what's what's your, your current experience? You're muted, Nafuti. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Melanie. I think the, in terms of the South African context, um, of course, we are the most industrialized country in Africa uh, in terms of the, the mining. Uh, and therefore, the most of, of our mining um, businesses uh, involves the use of, of a number of electric motors, which uh, consumes a lot of electricity if you were to think about the magnitude or the numbers that are deployed within the mining industry. And of course, many of them are, are being used for crushers, for grinders, for hoists, for pumps, for mills, for conveyor belts, for ventilation. And given the magnitude of the size of the mining industry in South Africa, the, the impact of the energy efficiency improvement within the system system perspective it's 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 significant and and therefore um, we we had to begin to engage them uh, also considering the fact that we have been struggling with the electricity supply and security for quite some some time and of course it worked in our advantage for a little bit because i think in the main the industry was also frustrated with with the ongoing electricity uh, shortages and as much as they also wanted to deploy some of their own interventions to improve the supply on site uh, in their areas of operation they were a bit welcome to any intervention, uh, policy intervention that government would put into place that would uh, perhaps ease the burden of load shedding. And therefore, it, we, we found them to be more, at least in the majority of them, uh, receptive to the idea of introducing the MEPS for instance, for electric motors as part of the overall system optimization approach. We had uh, one company that um, was very resistant, uh, primarily because if you look at the South African market in so far as electric motors are concerned, we are mainly the assemblers of the electric motors. We don't necessarily manufacture. So uh, the, the, the negative response from this single company which is which has got a bigger market share was that 
Um, the introduction of the IE3, for instance, which is what we wanted to adopt as an immediate intervention, uh, will significantly affect the industry, uh, the, the, the AC motors industry, in the sense that uh, they were not ready to for the IE3 introduction. Uh, and secondly, uh, the argument was that he or the company has a huge pot of SMMEs, small medium enterprises that they supply with electric motors and VSDs. And therefore, a sudden or a quick introduction uh, of the IE3 motors or maps uh, in, in, in relation to AC motors would kill the industry, especially the SMMEs, because then it would require them to uh, reinvest in improving uh, or rather replacing their IE2 and IE1 motors with the IE3 motors, which, which the argument was that the cost is, will be significant. And of course, we, 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 we acknowledged the input that the company provided to us. Uh, we, we called another stakeholder meeting. I think we had about three stakeholder meetings where uh, the company consent did not pitch, but it was only on the last day when we are about to finalize the proposed maps for electric motors that the, they wrote a very long letter to the Minister of Trade and Industry trying to block the process saying they were not given an adequate opportunity to apply their minds, their inputs were not uh, listened to, and so forth. Um, and obviously at the political level, the instruction was that go back and engage this company. And when we engaged them, fortunately, we were working with uh, Mike uh, from GLASP, who helped us a lot in terms of, of gathering data and justifying some of the technical benefits of moving from the IE1, IE2 to IE3, and, and, and also uh, justifying the research component that uh, significantly gave us the impetus to argue the case against the said um, company that was that was giving us then negative opposition in terms of, of moving forward, but in the end uh, we 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 had to use a concept of majority rule because we, we had the majority of the industry uh, giving us thumbs up to move towards IE three um, and. Uh, despite the fact that the, the the quantity in terms of the numbers of deployment was not uh, enough or rather is not huge from those independent companies or individual companies as compared to this particular company that argued that their main focus is on the SMMEs, which in the main, in the majority are black companies, uh, which then they had to use as an argument to say the government wants to kill the development of the SMMEs and so forth and so forth. But eventually we we had to, to make a decision. We, 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 we called them to a meeting. Um, we presented the facts on the table to them. We asked them to present their facts and their argument uh, necessarily did not convince us otherwise. And, and we eventually agreed that we would move as a country uh, towards the adoption of the, the maps for the IE3 as a national uh, requirement. And eventually, we, we had to go back to the political heads and inform them that, no, we had engaged. Evidence is here that we can move uh, and there are benefits in terms of movement and therefore we propose that we go ahead with the implementation or the, 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 yeah, the introduction of the maps for the electric motors. And, and fortunately, um, the political heads supported us uh, and the National Regulator for Compulsory Specifications eventually published or gazetted the, the new regulations, the VC9113 for the introduction of the maps for electric motors, which is mainly focused on IE3 requirements. So, so it wasn't a, a huge battle, considering that we, we were aided a bit by the fact that the industry themselves were frustrated by the, elect the electricity shortage over the years. And therefore they needed anything 
uh, that would help them to restore or keep at least stability uh, of the electricity, I mean, the, the energy generation and supply within the country, which would then help them to keep, you know, a, a, a uniform performance over a period because their performance was going up and down the as a result of the of the energy shortages so anything that would that would be seen to be um aiding them in in that respect they would accept hence we we, we are where we are where we are now in terms of the the regulations themselves the they were published for public comments and then the closing date was on the i think the 30 the 15th of november that was the closing date for public comments. So we are now uh, beginning to consolidate the inputs from the public comments and, and working towards finalizing the, the regulations themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naputi. And may I just say congratulations? <laughs> I know it's been a, a hard a hard journey. And um, Marcus and Chris are both nodding because we know they've both been through this same process. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to say it gets easier, but I'm not sure that's true, uh, but, but, but well, well done. And I think um, what's really um, interesting in, in what you've said and kind of feeds this conversation is the importance of the evidence that, um, you know, our colleagues in class, Mike Stoneland in particular, were able to help bring to that debate uh, to make sure that um, you were able as a government to, to you know, provide the right evidence and, and, and push, push this through. Uh, I think also interesting the the context, of course, your your power shortages um, making um, the need for efficiency a bit clearer, perhaps to industry. Um, as a contrast to Chris's experience, where fast investment, you know, because of the booming resources market, um, meaning that people aren't were perhaps prepared to give the time to to thinking about those longer term issues. So I think there's an interesting counterpoint there. Um, Steve, can I come back to you a moment because you've 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 watched these debates around the world between governments and industry um, for for decades. Um, and uh, as an organisation, have you got any you know best examples of how? engagement with industry has, has really worked that we can share with people um, and maybe even if you dare least good examples but but let's positive uh, focus on the positives for, for a start no i've been it's been a really fascinating debate um everyone is is, is making important points um i'm really encouraged to see the work that's being done in in, in south africa um you know if if i may mel I want to, f if I focus on an important point that's come out in all three discussions, and, and I think it really is just around the, the benefits of, of energy efficiency and probably a lack of awareness for it. Um, you know, uh, Chris spoke about the, you know, the, the reluctance, I forget the word that you used, Chris, but how the, 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 the industries there are, are, are maybe not always in favor of, of regulations. I think the way you get around that, and if you you, you ask Mel about, you know, the, the positive experiences, and he th I think the IEA deserves a lot of credit for putting a spotlight on the multiple benefits of, of energy efficiency. So maybe one of the ways, Chris, you get around that is by saying, if you just focus on efficiency, you want to get your material out of the ground faster. If you do it more efficiently, you're going to increase your your profitability and your competitiveness from the very early stages of production because you'll be using less energy. Um, I think South Africa is a good example of putting that message forward of how, you know, if you've got concerns with load shedding and, and the supply of electricity, we'll just use less of it and, um, and you'll solve that problem, at least in part. Um, I'll give a specific example, Mel. I don't want to name the, the country because they're not represented here, but there is another mining rich country in Africa that we're speaking with to try to get them to do more on efficiency. And, you know, their answer is to produce more power, to generate more power and kind of banging our heads and saying, no, just use less of it. You know, we're giving you solutions to, to, to use less. Don't generate more power if you, if, if, if you don't need to. So I think South Africa is, is a good example and maybe we sh should connect 
uh, Maputi with the, the people I'm speaking with in this this other country to to show them uh, uh, maybe a better way to to do it. So now I'm I'm really enjoying the 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 discussion and and you know the the challenges that are are being highlighted here. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, fascinating. Um, one of the things that's coming up in our conversations with countries uh, on a regular basis, um, and um, I remember, Chris, we had this problem when I was working in Australia too, um, is is how do you how do you um, how do you test motors? How do you have um, when 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 most of the motors aren't, aren't aren't made in the countries that are sitting around this table and the, and the countries that we're talking to? Um, and there needs to be some sort of quality control, some some evidence about performance of those motors. How do we recommend to regulators they cope with that situation? So is it through building test labs, which many countries feel they have to build test labs for every product they regulate, but that's expensive, and the business models for the test labs are uh, it can be a bit doubtful if there's not um, other requirements for them beyond the government programs. Um, and there are you know, other options for recognizing um, testing that's done by others in other parts of the world, but not everybody's regulatory framework allows for that. So I just wonder if we could just have a quick go around the three countries again and say, how how do you provide for, for testing? Do you accept test results from other countries? How, how do you manage that process? And, and let's go back to Marcus to start with, please. Yeah, um, in terms of standard development, the Canadian Standards Association has been a leader in the world, especially around um, testing motors and the verification and validation of motor efficiency that has been done in Canada through um, mostly through utility efforts and sponsorship to find out which which is the true efficiency that's, um, that's most representative for the industry. I mean, standards have to be repeatable, reproducible, representative, and reasonable. It's my four hours of standard development. And the representativeness is, is really the challenge. How do you make a test, a laboratory test, represent what's really happening in the real world? under different voltage conditions and um, operating conditions that all impact the loading of the motor and the energy use. Um, we do have good, solid, very solid motor standards. Uh, most of them require a dynamometer for testing. And the problem is that for large motors, you, don't really have a dynamometer anymore. You can't test them very accurately or test them um, through through a dynamometer anymore. Anything above the MEPS level, above 1,000 kilowatts, you're going to run into trouble having load testing done. So you have to do simulation of um, an engineering analysis and, and um, come up with an efficiency number of that motor. And I think the manufacturers are doing a reasonable job with that. Um, the the problem, the real problem, is the system approach. I think because you cannot test the system approach in the lab anymore because now you have components of a motor, a drive, a gear reducer, and a piece of equipment that you need to be tested. And a lot of the mining equipment is very very large. I mean, you can have motors up to 20 30 thousand horsepower driving sag mills and ball mills uh, like we have in british columbia and you got to have something i think something more user friendly that helps the customer understand how does the system perform as a whole and one good example that we have found is that some of our customers have installed especially doing new mine design. They've installed um, low speed synchronous motors to drive the ball mill and the sag mill with a variable frequency drive. And with that combination of e equipment, they were able to eliminate the gear reducer that's usually fit in between. Uh, so motor 
efficiency is slightly lower for lower speed motors, but the overall efficiency was higher because you were able to eliminate the losses of the gear reducer. So the system approach is really, really important. The testing of that becomes much, much more challenging in a, in a lab laboratory environment. But there's other tests and we found through our um, refurbishment, motor refurbishment testing, that there's a series of tests that can be done by even by motor service centers doing the repair and rewinding of existing motors, very large motors. You can do a no-load test, you can do insulation test, resistance test, and through that you can actually have a good uh, confidence that the efficiency was maintained during the repair process. So you can do a combination of tests and you don't have to necessarily do dynamometer, very expensive controlled dynamometer testing of very large machines. Thank you, Marcus. Really, really interesting stuff again. And um, how do you just, just, just briefly, because it's one of the issues that um, uh, people have, how do you ensure compliance? Do you have a, I've lost Marcus, so I'll go to Marcus. You, sorry, I lost you for a moment. I just, I wanted to ask you how you ensure compliance with your MEPS for those motors that you do regulate. Um, what what testing do you require and where can that be done? So testing has to be done in, in Canada for um, motors that qualify for the MEPS through the Canadian Standards Association C390 test, which is equivalent to the and harmonized, fully harmonized with the IEEE 112 method B test, as well as the IEC um, test method. They're fully harmonized for the MEPS level. And that has, uh, I think it has worked out well. We've done, in the past, we've done some validation testing and we found that in general, the distribution of efficiencies that were tested to the standard was acceptable. So we believe that you cannot test every motor, which is way too costly. But uh, in general, for the MEPS level, I think we have a reasonable estimate of motor efficiency. I think the real challenge is the larger motors that um, are difficult to, to test. But what about the, um, so so you, what was the business model for the test labs? How, is there enough work um, in, in, in the Canadian environment for them to be able to survive or, or are they supported by government? So when the utility, before the MEPS regulation or the IE3 regulations came in, the utilities had, um, such as BC Hydro, Manitoba Hydro, Hydro-Quebec, had incentive programs to encourage customers to purchase premium efficiency motors. And at that time, we had several test labs in Canada. But now that the regulation has come in uh, and there's no more incentive, from a utility to install um, premium efficiency motors, all the test labs have closed down. <laughs> so there's no testing, there's no motor efficiency testing in Canada at this time. But you have a regulation that requires testing yes. to be done in Canada, but you don't have to. But neither, neither is there any motor manufacturing done in Canada either. No, okay. So it's and all... Yeah, either yeah. Um, overseas or North America and in, in the United States. Okay. And Chris, what's the situation now in Australia? Um, how do you do, run your compliance program for MEPS for Motors? Yeah, good, good point. And um, look, the, the piece about test labs is a really good discussion. And look, Australia has some test labs but they're really focused on the equipment that you can pull out and measure a motor in isolation. So it's quite narrow in the power ranges that they can test. 
And it's also really limited away from systems to separable motors. And we've done a bit of analysis of equipment import data. There's, there's not a lot of motors made in Australia these days. So import data captures most of the market. And we find that 88% of motor imports are currently outside of our testing and compliance regime. So we, we can talk about mutual recognition. We can talk about ways to try and uh, improve the quality of testing. But there's a really big scope piece here that at the moment, we're capturing one-tenth of the motor market. And that, that's probably our, our problem number one of let's, let's get the capture rights and the hurdle rights and then not get too caught up in the testing. That, that said, following being invited to this seminar, we thought we better do a bit of fact checking on what, what MRAs we do use in Australia for motors in mining. And there's not many that are used for efficiency, but there is a lot of activity for mining equipment MRAs in explosive atmosphere certification. And that, that relationship and precedent is quite strong. And the, the appetite from our um, testing and certification agencies for efficiency-based MRAs is quite strong, provided there's a reasonable justification for it. So I'd say there's, there's certainly interest in expanding uh, mutual recognition for motor certification, but we think first through our GEMS um, review process we need to get the scope right and we need to get the threshold right. Very good points, very well made. Thank you, Chris, uh, very interesting. Aputi, with your new regulations that you've um, gazetted um, in November, um, what's the plan for, for testing and compliance? Do you, do you know that yet? Um, have, you, have you decided how, what you will accept? Um, in terms of testing? Yes, Melanie, I think uh, we, are, we are a bit fortunate um, in the sense that we don't have a, a local manufacturing company for, for the electric motors. Most of our motors are being imported. And therefore, the, the application of the maps um, will be regulated at the entrance level where the national regulator for compulsory specifications would receive applications uh, from industry in terms of importing uh, these motors uh, as per the maps and therefore it is at that point where the regulations would be enforced in terms of the importation of, of such of such motors. At the moment, uh, locally, we our testing facility is limited to um, 80 kilowatt motors. Uh, and therefore, if you look beyond that, uh, we are unable to do any testing in that regard. So, so we, we are banking on the fact that uh, because it would be a regulated market, and therefore the uh, we need to beef up our ability and capabilities to enforce the regulations, particularly in relation to the issuing of what we call the letter of authority to sell these products locally. So you can only get that from NRCS uh, as a regulating entity, but also uh, on condition that you comply with the regulations. Therefore, you will get will get the the the, the approval to to import such motors. Of course, uh, one has to, co to, to be cognizant of the fact that, the, especially in the developing countries, I think the investment in the infrastructure and facilities uh, relating to particularly around energy efficiency improvement was, was not so much uh, in place and therefore any interventions that are of regulatory in nature uh, 
would then require an upgrade in the test facilities. And, and at times it's a, it's, it, it becomes a competitive or a competition between the requirement to invest in the facility and the, the need for um, the public service in terms of, of goods and services that the government have to invest money for the public. And therefore there is that weight that has to be put on to justify why you would need to spend such amount of money to build a new test laboratory to test uh, this particular uh, type of appliances or equipments as compared to having to use that money to pro provide services to the public. So, so that those, are, those are the debates that in most cases we find ourselves having to contend with um, in government in terms of securing, securing funding for, for the upgrade of test laboratories. But as I said, as, as in our case, we are, we are fortunate in the sense that uh, most of our motors are being imported. The only, there were a few companies that are doing motor rewinding, which in the main would have to then uh, up their cases uh, or their, their businesses in terms of making sure that they comply with the requirement of the MAPS insofar as efficiency is concerned. So we, we are hoping that even with the uh, discussions around the SADC region through the SACRI and the East African Communities um, uh, Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, we would be in a position to at least have a common understanding in harmonizing the standards, but also to have a common approach in terms of centralizing or, or perhaps uh, identifying the spot where we can um, as a as a community, uh, invest in putting in place a a testing facility that will be saving that will be capable enough to serve both the uh, SADC region as well as the uh, East African region. So those are the discussions that we are still discussing at at the regional level to look at the, at ways to harmonize the implementation and adoption of the maps, but also to address issues of, of infrastructure um, availability to support the regulatory functions that are required. So I think for us, uh, the, the, we are a better, we are a much better, in a much better position in terms of regulations because um, what would then happen if you have to, apply, to comply with the requirement of the maps of the IE3, then it means when you, re when you require the LOA from NRCS, to import these machines, you've got to bring on board also a testing report from accredited test laboratories that confirms that that product that you are importing complies with the MAPS for IE3, which would then be an international standard that, that, that most of the, the motor industry or motor manufacturers would have to comply with. So for us, I think that is an advantage that we are sitting with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maputi. That was a really it's one of the real the hearts of the, the, the issues that we're, we're, we're struggling with in these conversations. And, and it's come up in many regions. So it comes up in, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in Latin America as well, in, in, in the regions where we're all collectively working with developing emerging economies who are starting out on programs or are trying to um, uh, step up their, 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 their programs. But uh, Motors is a particularly tricky one because um, you know, setting out test labs for, for lighting is much simpler, um, you know, and some of the domestic appliances is much simpler, but motors, motors is, a, is much more of an issue. So thanks for alerting us to that. And, and that is a model that we, we are kind of trying to explore for, for other, other regions too. Um, Steve, you've been part of the conversations we've been having in Latin America about this. Um, and we've been, you know, promoting this idea. Of, of regional capacity. Have you got any further thoughts on that since since we last discussed and, and in the context of this conversation today? Yeah, I mean, maybe I could add just a little bit. I was really encouraged to hear Mapudi put a, uh, to talk about the need for, for regional harmonization. Um, I really think that's critical. I could see no reason why all of the countries in the SADC would each need to have their own testing facility for example. So if there's a way to have some regional cooperation there, 
you're going to see, you know, uh, an, an acceleration of this this movement towards energy efficiency. Um, I think the discussion is also, Mel, highlighting the need to take a holistic view when it comes to, to maps. It's not just about the standards itself. It's about, you know, the monitoring, the verification, the enforcement. Um, you know, again, I don't I don't want to mention the country because it's not represented here. It's a number of years back in a developing country, we personally, ICA, went out and purchased motors and had them tested, and we found about 20% weren't in compliance with the efficiency that was shown on the label. So just, you know, one example where MVE wasn't working. And you mentioned Latin America. The very beginning, I talked about the work we're trying to do in Chile because mining is such a, a critical sector there and a big energy user, and therefore a big emitter of CO2. One of the issues with Chile is that, you know, they don't have the ability to do testing, in particular, if they increase their, their ambition on maps. So we're trying to encourage them to create a regulatory framework that will allow them to accept testing done from another country in the region. So um, you know, just to, to reiterate a point and to, and to conclude that remark is, is harmonization where it's possible is, is so important. And if, um, if, if Southern Africa is able to make some inroads there, then I think um, good for that region, but then also an opportunity for sharing best practices in Latin America and other parts of the world. Thanks, thanks, Steve. Yeah, that's that's um, absolutely our our experience as well in having these conversations, and one of the reasons we wanted to put this this group together today to explore how how these things can be done. Um, the the cost of testing is high, and you know the, it, it's not something that, that that every single country who wants to regulate motors can possibly absorb. So we need to, to explore these mechanisms. But as we said earlier, that does require, and you pointed this out with Chile, that does require that their regulatory framework allows for that. And in some cases, that would require changing of, um, you know, higher level regulations than, than just the energy efficiency ones, because sometimes we're associating energy efficiency with, um, you know, other types of regulation, like Chris said, you know, explosive um, uh, so safety situations, sometimes it's electrical safety. There's all sorts of regulations that we've been hooking now Max on over the years, and they have to have the basic uh, ability to be able to accept um, uh, test requirement test results that aren't aren't on on shore. So it's something that we need to be thinking about more. Chris, you have your hand up, please. Please, please do go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up and echo one of Steve's comments then about needing to be a little bit holistic about the system uh, efficiency for motor efficiency. Uh, we've, we've talked to a number of large Australian um, entities that have voluntarily adopted a standard higher than our minimum for motor efficiency. So we, we've asked them, how, how did it go? And there's a number of steps in that value chain beyond the the lab that are needed or the testing lab that are needed. And when we when we talked to them, their first piece was coming up with a, a policy of, yes, we're going to do this. There's a good business case for it. It pays for itself. We accept we need to do it. OK, we're going to implement uh, IE4 motors across the board. Uh, but then getting that spec in their projects with the engineers is easier said than done because there's an education piece and a bit of concern about how to integrate that into systems. Then for new projects, generally those, um, those specifications are going out to tender where the original equipment manufacturers responding with bids, many of which didn't match the original spec. So there's a little bit of upskilling needed for the, the client side engineers to check that the proposal or contract that comes back is actually what they asked for. Then the next part was literal physical inspection of equipment delivered to site. They had a contract that might have said IE4 motors, but the equipment that turned up was IE2. And then the last of their concerns is, does the motor match its label for efficiency, which is really the, the role of the test lab? So I, I think getting the test labs in place and having certainty that 
something does what it says on the label is really important, but there's a number of complementary and perhaps education measures that need to go with it to ensure that it's used. Thank you. Again, good points, but well made, Chris. I mean, and Australia's compliance program is very good in that context of making sure that, you know, you start with everybody understanding what the rules are um, and, you know, so that those who want to comply can comply and then, you know, going through the pyramid until you get to the point where you actually do sort of flush out the people who are kind of deliberately contravening things. So it's a really, I think it's a really cost effective approach to compliance and, and one that's a great model, a model for others. Um, I wanted to touch, we've, we've, we've not got many people on the line, so we're, instead of, sort of taking the Q&A, we carry on with our Q&A between ourselves. So just let, for a start, let me know if any of you want to ask a question of anybody else on the panel. Um, and if you do, just, just put your hand up, please. Um, that will be most welcome. But there's a couple of points in the meantime I'd, I'd like to um, touch on. And one of them is um, we've, we've, we've gone into the systems um, territory a, a few times in this conversation. And one of the problems in the past has been um, that the, the indiv individual notice kind of <laughs> relatively easy to test. It's more complicated than any other product that we tend to regulate, but it's relatively easy to test. Um, but once you start to get into um, the, the motor plus the driven device gets slightly more complicated. And then when you get into the broader system, even more so. So it becomes much more difficult to regulate in a conventional sort of a way, in a, in a MEPS type way. Um, uh, and, 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 and to ensure compliance, because you end up with an infinite number of combinations of things. Digital technologies, you know, modern sensors um, that can can tell us what a motor is doing in service or what a system is doing in real time would allow us to change our approach and understand much better um, the, the actual um, um, duty cycle of a, of a particular motor or system and then be able to perhaps improve efficiency by understanding that, that better and understanding how, how policy can, can drive improvements. Has anybody got any experience of these kind of digital energy management approaches, either in the lab at the moment or, or full scale in, 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 in factories? Any, anybody got any comments to make on what digitalization can bring us in, in terms of motor efficiency and system efficiency? I'll have a go and it's more around the, the system efficiency rather than um, using digitalization. Um, but one of, the, one of the methods we've used in the Australian market is where, where an asset is relatively homogenous, um, typically in our building stock, uh, we've looked very much at performance ratings for the building as a whole through things like our neighbor's ratings. Uh, and that provides a, a performance and actual measured output benchmarked against others to see who's doing well. And it's, it's focused on the outcome of the whole system. And we've, we've looked fairly hard at whether we can translate that from uh, assets like uh, office buildings and data centers into our resources sector, but we, we really struggle with the homogeneity of the, uh, the stock. So it's one that we haven't solved, uh, but I think we have concluded that that broad benchmarking approach doesn't really work when you have quite a, an uncomparable site base. I don't know if any of the rest of the panel has any views on the digitalization aspects. And what you say, Chris, I mean, clearly is what's led us to energy management standards, which are have been built on the, um, you know, the previous um, quality and environmental standards type audit, audit type approach that uh, and um, the, the paper trail that you build uh, around all of that. Um, but in, is there any is uh, but but that's obviously. Um, somewhat difficult to regulate. Um, you can say that people have to follow a certain approach, but what the outcomes of that approach are going to be uh, is uh, kind of, of course, more difficult to, 
to to to, to discuss. Anybody? Any other thoughts on on whether the opportunities, what what opportunities digitalization brings us to to go more towards the systems approach? Any experience? Anybody would like to share? Yeah, I have a couple of comments regarding the um, system approach. Uh, we encourage customers to use variable frequency, variable speed drives as part of the motor system. And we found that manufacturers of variable speed drives, they give you an efficiency of the variable frequency drive of 97%. And then when you ask them, well, what does that mean? It means 100% speed, 100% torque, full, full speed, full torque efficiency rating of that drive. Well, that doesn't mean anything because the drive is there not to operate at full speed. It's there to control the speed and the part load efficiency of a variable frequency drive is much, much different than the full load um, speed. So that's why at Canadian Standards Association, we actually developed a standard to test the spectrum of um, speed torque variations in variable frequency drives so we can add those components to the motor and get the overall system efficiency much more educated. Um, the other problem we found or opportunity challenge is that the new motor technologies are not are totally different than the induction motors. Like if you have permanent magnet motors, synchronous um, switched reluctance motors, they are not the 1500 RPM at 50 Hertz or 1800 RPM at 60 Hertz capability anymore. They are a motor that can be programmed at any speed that you want, that you can optimize your system at. And we found that for example, air compressor manufacturers, they use that technology and they say, oh, I don't, 1800 RPM is not the right optimum speed of the air compressor. I want to run it at 5000 RPM and I get a much better efficiency. And I can only do that with a permanent magnet motor or a switched reluctance motor technology that requires a drive to operate. And it's really that whole extended product system efficiency that is going to look so much different than in the past where we just dealt with general purpose motors at given horsepower and given speed and given enclosure ratings. I think the future is going to look totally, totally different. Like even in the residential sector, your washing machine used to be a very standard motor and it had four speeds for rinse and um, spin cycles, very simple. Now a washing machine, a residential washing machine is a complex um, permanent magnet motor at many, many different 20, 30, 50 program levels that you can't figure out, but it's a, an appliance where you just press start and it's self-sensing and self-controlling and optimizing, and I think we're going to see that type of approach of whether you call it uh, digitalization or uh, intelligence, that's going to go into the industrial appliance as well. We're going to see motors that are self-configuring, uh, uh, pumps, pump systems that are self-configuring, self-tuning. Uh, first, at the smaller scale, like we already see it in circulator pumps that are used in buildings, but it's going to go um, upscale, larger scale, and we're going to see those in mining and resource-intensive industries. But then when you look at it as an industrial appliance, the motor efficiency is re irrelevant. Like it's, I don't, it, who cares, right? It's like, I want the system efficiency to be self-learning and optimized to the application that's driving. And the overall result is what makes the impact. It's not the component efficiencies of a motor and a drive and a gearbox and this and that. So it's, it's gonna be, it's very interesting times ahead, I think. And these new technologies are very promising. And 
learning is, yeah, edu I think education, I've seen a lot of variable frequency drives on put on motors. And when I go to the industrial site, they will operate them at 100% speed. They use them for soft start. Oh, I didn't, that's all I need, right? No, you can use the VFD to control your process and actually achieve much more significant energy savings than, um, but it, that's a lot of training and knowledge and energy management is required rather than, and it's very difficult to regulate those, right? It's, yeah. it's almost impossible to regulate applic applications, but it, the training of it is uh, very important. I mean, also what we've done with our user oriented standards where we use ideal state benchmarking approach of what it's sort of a wire to to water, wire to air efficiency for clean water pumps. We have one for slurry pumping systems, refrigeration systems, fan systems, where we take the actual conditions a user has and benchmark it to their ideal state of the actual work that's being done by the system. And then the customer or the user can um, use that data if he does it on a regular basis, hourly, he can use that for continuous monitoring and continuous improvement. And we find those have a, a significant impact on the customers because it's his data, it's his numbers and his improvement, he's showing his improvements uh, in real, almost real time. Interesting vision of the future. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Marcus. Um, I'd like to, we, we're, we're coming towards the end. I'd just like to do a round of comments, if I may, and ask everybody for, for two things. One is um, where they see the opportunities for international collaboration, what, what they've seen uh, work well, you know, what's the, what are the benefits, and also you know, what What their number one recommendation to um, fellow policymakers would be. But on this, in this context, if we could stick to the to the conventional minimum of energy performance standards approach, because that's where, you know, we, we wanted to focus some, uh, this, 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 this discussion for today. Um, if, we, if, we, if we could go around the table and, 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 and have those two points from everybody, and then we'll, we'll, then we'll close. And maybe I could start with Chris. Sure. Look, I'll, I'll start with the international collaboration piece. And I was really interested to hear Maputi's comments about getting some of the industry on side. And I, I think there's a lesson for us in that, that we, we need to do a bit more active seeking of some coaches or supporters in industry because nothing is more powerful if uh, the regulators uh, support, so the regulated support being regulated. Uh, so that, that's one of the takeaways for me about uh, this session and benefit of collaboration straight off. But really, really keen to hear from the others, maybe offline about other ways to try and entice and build that industry support. Uh, I'm sure, Steve, some of your um, copper constituency are active in Australia. Maybe uh, some of them are willing to, to lend their voice to help us advocate in this space. So very, very keen to, um, to follow that up. Uh, and I, I have to confess, um, I didn't catch the other question. So could you repeat it, please? Yes, what, what your number one piece of advice for fellow policymakers um, who are trying to um, uh, regulate minimum and energy performance standards for, for motors? I think it's looking at the, the Australian markets. And again, because we are a, a separated series of small grids with lots of solar, perhaps we're, we're early in this piece. Uh, but there's a really big capital investment wave coming to try and manage storage in that system. And you can either do it by storage on the supply side or smart and uh, efficient demand side. Uh, so for us, we have a real interest in 
driving that capex for miners in particular to be more efficient and ideally efficient in ways where we can control the load to help flex and avoid uh, supply disruption and curtailment. Good point. Thank you very much. Naputi, what, what benefits of international collaboration, where you think it might go to your benefit in the future? And number one piece of advice to fellow policymakers. I think, Melanie, the, the international collaboration is very critical in ensuring that the, because the, the, the global communities are connected, uh, we are living in a world where we are connected either in politics or in economic activities. Uh, it's even worse now, we are connected uh, as a result of the climate change impact. Nobody would now act to be immune to uh, climate change consequences. Um, and I think in the main, that drives the international communities, international cooperation to be in the forefront uh, of addressing some of these issues pertaining to uh, the adoption of energy efficiency uh, standards and regulations and policies uh, as a measure to you know contribute towards the reduction or the impact on climate change but also to um, work as one and share experiences in so far as the impact of some of these catastrophic events that are taking place as a result of, of climate change are concerned. Uh, so, so the international cooperation plays a critical role in terms of, of, of addressing that. But secondly, I think uh, uh, it is also critical that as policy developers, uh, we become honest in, in, in the way in which we approach our industries and stakeholders. Honest in the level of transparency that we present to them, uh, honest in the data that we present to them, uh, but also honest uh, in terms of the objectives of some of the policies that we want to put across. Uh, because if you do not become honest and transparent uh, to the stakeholders that you are targeting, but also the industries that you are targeting, you are bound to receive resistance from them because they are driven by money, they are driven by making income. Um, so anything else that would be seen to be eating into their, into their revenue, uh, they, will, they will resist that. But then if you give them the understanding of why certain things have to happen and and you give them evidence of what or why certain things are happening and why there should be a change you are likely to get support from them because if you look at the impact of climate change it doesn't matter whether you are a CEO of a company, you are earning millions of dollars as, as an individual. But when catastrophe strikes, it doesn't measure that uh, Melanie, because he's a CEO, is earning a lot of money, let me spare him or her and move to the rest. It affects everybody else. And therefore, you need to create that, that, that sense of, of, of understanding, a uh, sense of understanding of humanity by those that are running our industries, such that they see value in the, in the contribution that they can make, besides only looking at money as a revenue that they want to, to collect at, any, at, at all times. But I, I just think that that forms a critical you know, component of how we would move towards you know, changing the perception, but also getting support that we need from those that are 
the I mean regarded as the captains of the industry. Um, transparency, uh, doing enough research, uh, justifying our day our information or our our argument with with data and and evidence, but also communicating our intentions as policymakers uh, and the benefits of the activities or the policies that we want to put across. Uh, and I think that for me would, would go a long way in terms of, of, of you know, um, seeing the greater adoption of, of energy efficiency and clean energy technologies um, international. But, but coupled with that is the need for international cooperation. Regional corporations in, in, in different areas of, 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 our, of our countries are critical so that we, we can be able to move as one, as, as one humanity uh, with one purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mafuji. Um, very, very wise words, very emotive words. We, we have come to the end of our time, and I would like to suggest, if our other speakers don't mind, to say that I don't think we can better what Mafuti's just said. I think um, it stands as a, a wonderful um, end note to our conversation. And um, with all your permission, we will carry on this conversation uh, in different environments, in different formats. And it just remains for me to thank you all and um, we'll, we'll be in touch. And thank you for those people on the line who've been listening to our, our conversation today. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye.